course now. Um, some of you still not don't know how to uh, join the, the, the room or they just don't want to join or they joined and they, they're not. I, I visited some rooms. There was no discussion over the course of what uh, uh, it's all about your assignment, which is fine. Um, I do understand that. Um, anyway, uh, let's uh, share uh, this, the presentation for this class. So as you saw in the video, it's basically, uh, we are talking about the manufacturing process. In the next uh, chapter, we'll talk about service process. And then we will be going over some um, applications of the service process and manufacturing process and how it's done. Hopefully we can finish it uh, by end of today. So um, as you saw in the video, so uh, we will continue once you the products, different type of products there. So the chapter six talks about the manufacturing process and you will be um, <clears throat> uh, learning about understanding the manufacturing process, what's the manufacturing process, understand, the uh, production process uh, mapping and the little law, something called the little laws, uh, explain uh, how the manufacturing process are organized, which is we saw some of it in the, in the, in the video, and understand how to design and analyze the assembly line. Um, basically, the production process is made of a three part three steps. The first step is the source that part is needed. So what kind of products is needed there to, to, to do that. The second part is uh, uh, how to make the products. And the third part is the customer, the delivery products. So uh, uh, these are made of uh, three steps that is a uh, process uh, production process. Now the lead time is the time that to respond to a customer order. So when the customer is ordering something is how much time you have to respond to it. And uh, it, it, it differs from one to another. So the customer order decoupling point is uh, where the really the inventories is, posi is positioned uh, allow the uh, uh, to allow the entities to supply the chain operate independently. So it's already the the inventory has a in the situation where uh, they can supply this product to to them. Um, lean manufacturing is as a process of uh, uh, ways of achieving a high level of customer service with a minimum invent inventory. Uh, investment, as we said in the first few classes, something like just in time. Uh, it's, excuse me, it's one of the lean manufacturing uh, process. Now, uh, types of, uh, probably types of firms or operation organization is basically it uh, make to stock. So uh, it's, it is, it, it's a means that the server customers on demand from the finished good inventories. Uh, assembly to order is combined a number of pre-assembled models, but it's kind of already, but you can put them together once they come according to the customer specification. And make to order is make the customer product uh, uh, from a raw material, from a startup material part on and component. And then you have uh, engineer to order is, you haven't done anything for it. First of all, you sit with the customer, you look at their requirement and accordingly, you try to build your, your products. Now, uh, example of, uh, uh, these uh, products are, uh, for example, 
if you have uh, in the stock, you have uh, example like a televisions, um, clothing, packaging foods. These are uh, food product. These are examples to stock, make to stock. And, and it's an uh, essential issue in satisfying the customer is to balance the level of inventory against the level of customer service. So um, uh, these things is uh, uh, easy with the unlimited inventory, but inventory costs money. So you don't want to have uh, too much inventories waiting in the, in the warehouse because this is going to cost you money. So, but in the same time, you want to uh, offer the customers as per its requirement or under request, you can do that. So you have to do a trade-off between cost inventory and the level of customer service that uh, must be made and the satisfaction level. Um, so it's usually use, uh, you use the uh, lean manufacturing to achieve the higher service level for a giving inventory uh, investment. So you wanna make sure you bring things just in time, you produce things on time and you supply them on time to the customers. Now a primary task is to define uh, a customer order in the term of uh, alternative component, uh, uh, alternative components since the, the, thank you very much. Uh, these are carried in the inventories. Um, sometimes, uh, usually like a Dell computer, you have, uh, you know, you wait for the order because the issues is that uh, um, you might, uh, customer looks for a certain specification like in the RAM or, a, or the size of the PC or the speed or the screen. These are all, uh, you know, different component that you put it together. So you, you, you assemble to order and the more component, the total number of combination component there, the higher number of different type of, uh, uh, for example, Dell uh, PC you, you prefer, uh, you, you prepare. Uh, one capa uh, capability required to design that has enabled, as we said, is, uh, Usually, it looks like a, a wide varieties of selection. So this is why you have the components is ready, and you just uh, put things together, and then you give it to the to the according to the need of the customer. Um, the other type, as we said in the video, and also in 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 uh, here, is uh, make to order or engineers to order. Uh, for example, a uh, Boeing process for making commercial aircraft is a good example. First, they, the people, uh, the customer makes an order and sometimes takes over 10 years to deliver uh, uh, an, an, a, uh, an airplane or it, uh, yes, 10 years, because uh, it is, uh, you know, uh, you have to first order and then they make it. Uh, or uh, engineer to order. So there is a certain specification you might be looking for. So they have to sit with you and find out what you exactly looking for. And then this where is the, uh, you make the order. Uh, customer order decoupling point could be better in either raw material at the manufacturing side or the supplier inventories. So the decoupling, it doesn't have to be, you know, uh, in the, your warehouse ready uh, because you are gonna have time to sit with the customer and, you know, take its order and how it's supposed to be built. Um, I think one of the, the, the other options that you're looking at, which is you are utilizing it, is the buses that you, you, you ride sometimes. Uh, these are all built in one manufacturer but each one has a different a blueprint, shall I say. Um, the same manufacturers, I think, in New Flyers, uh, it's called, uh, they, they make buses for, uh, you know, bands, music, musician bands, for, this, uh, for the politicians, 
uh, for the uh, buses, uh, transportations. Uh, so they have different uh, for the jails, for hospital. They have the, it. They wait for you to make an order, and then they engineer it according to your to 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 your customers or to your need to do it. So that's the difference here. Now, um, this is the production process mapping, and it's basically uh, it's depend on what do you have develop a high level of map for your supply chain process. So you need to look at your supply and the the, the process of that's how the supply is happening uh, in order to understand when you're going to get the product. Uh, and how you minimize, we took also in chapter three, uh, four, talking about, uh, you know, how we minimize the risk of, you know, the supply might uh, not supply you uh, or mitigate the risk of supplying. So you, you need to develop a high level map of supply chain process and how this process is happening from outside to the inside within the corporation to the final good. Um, uh, useful to understand how the material flow and where are the inventory help. Some, the, the, the closest is the inventory, the better. If you notice, for example, um, recently most of the companies try to do the inventory very near to them because this is might take less time, less effort, and less risky to take uh, to do to deliver the uh, the raw material from the inventor uh, from the warehouse. And the uh, first step is to analyze the flow of material, which is in the production process and how it's done. And it, it if you see this here in the histogram, says. Well, the suppliers supply you with the sources, then you're gonna see the transit in the transit. You need to have some buffering places, uh, buffering in the raw material. So you have like at least 20% of material standing there raw materials, just in case if the supplier is not, for some reason was not able to, to send you this. And then you do the factory, and you do the processing. And also when it comes to the good, you, you, want, you need to have some buffering there to make sure that, uh, you know, um, if something goes wrong with the factory, at least you have a uh, goods is ready to be delivered. And the time of the transit that to deliver to reach to the customers. So these are the things that you need to look at it when you're doing a, produ a production uh, process in the manufacturing. Um, so uh, the the little law it says that the the, the flow of items through a production process can be described as uh, probably uh, using the little law, and it says that inventory equal with the throughput rate and the flow time. Now, what's the throughput throughput rate, it means the long-term average rate of the flow through the process. Uh, so how long it takes to have this uh, production is done. The flow time is a time for a single unit to travel, to tra traverse the entire process. So the single unit is different the whole time of the uh, things is getting processed. And uh, uh, inventory, uh, which is, uh, it is the material held in the firm. So these are the three process of, uh, to, to, to look at the little law, which is in inventory throughput rate and flow time. Uh, so if you wanna look at the throughput rate, then you will go, inventory uh, divided by uh, a flow time uh, rate. Now, um, the inventory is basically, we are here, we're talking about um, the measurement, the total average value of inventories. 
So it, there is some uh, terms that accountants use, some terms that uh, you know uh, operation management use to um, to to measure whether the the the, um, the business is running efficiently. Uh, or it needs some um, improvement. So it's a very important for them to look at these two things. And uh, so uh, basically is the total average value of inventories. Uh, and this is used in, in, in accounting, the sum of the value uh, of the raw material uh, work in the process and finish good inventories. So everything before goes to the customers is calculated as a, by financial statement to see the cost of the inventory, whether the product is getting produced uh, or in the warehouse or final goods and still in the warehouse. They're all cost of the inventory, cost of good producing. And inventory turnover is the cost of goods sold divided by average inventory value. So the cost of goods sold probably uh, it's a use it, they use it uh, because they want to see uh, how much you are keeping as inventory versus how much is costing you to to, to produce one unit, and the, the days of supplies, which is the inverse uh, of inventory turn skill. Now, the organization of production process, it basically talks about the project, uh, type of project, um, the work, the product re remains in a fixed area and uh, the equipment is moved around the product. So you have the product never moves around and the equipment keep coming to to adjust the to to uh, to produce this product, and there is a we talked about the work center, which is the shop so, uh, shop, is similar to the equipment uh, or function or in a group. So there is a group, and it's different group, and each group they have a kind of a, they come in and start working on the product, and it's like a work center there. The manufacturing cell, they are two, the different work of uh, processing organization. And a, a manufacturing cell, all you need is probably need the definitions, but uh, the manufacturing cell is a de dedicated area where the product that are similar in a processing requirement are produced. Um, the assembly line is where it's a most famous one and usually used in lots of manufacturing is that the, the work process are arranged according to the progressive step-by-step step which the product is made. And in the car manufacturing, they usually, they use the assembly line in the lab, in the PCs, in mobile. You see the product is moving and they put things on it and it keeps moving until it comes into the final uh, finished good. And the continuous is the ones that is like a, as a very simple product, but the high quantity, there is no, there is no variety in it and usually is produced, keeps going. And this is kind of different kind of, uh, it's not assembly line, it's just a few equipment that produce a similar things on without stopping. So these are the different kind of, uh, um, probably uh, if you wanna look at them, it's a, a production process. So in general, the product process mm, probably works this way. They've, as we, as we said, is first of all, you need to look at whether a, uh, there is a mass customizations happening or there is insufficient process. So, um, inefficient process there. Um, so um, basically what you're looking at, you're looking at um, uh, there is a, uh, if it's a low one of the kind where it is under demanded high is a continuous process. And if it's, uh, it's basically 
um, if, if the product is a, is, a, is a high volume, so if it's, if it's a high standardized and it's a, it's a low, then you will get a, a continuous uh, uh, process. But if it's the product is a standardizations and uh, you know the product volume is uh, not very high, is like a manufacturing cells is happening. So you need to look at this and see where the product is, your product is looking at situation, whether it's a, a one of the kind and it's low or high standardized commodity product and whether is the volume is high or low, that's usually will be uh, defining the thing, uh, the process is done. Now, the production system design, um, we have, uh, we look at the, the, how the production it's happening and how we design sometimes that makes a big difference whether we're gonna need more people when the work is, lo uh, the load is high or we need the less people. So this is how, how it's done. The, pr the, the project layout is the product uh, remains in a fixed location. So the product never moved and the high degree uh, of task ordering is in common. So you, you uh, the product stays there and there is high degree of people uh, you making the requirement to come in there and to do these things. And, and the project layout may be developed by arranging the material accordingly to their assembly priorities. Like for example, if you look at the building a plane or a jet is usually the one spot and the products comes in there and the assembly comes in there to do that. Now the work center, it's, it's different. And the work center is, is uh, most common approach to develop this type of layout is to arrange the work center a, a way that optimize the movement of materials. Um, optim uh, and sometimes it's referred to a department focus. So uh, it's focused on a particular type of operations usually. Um, Now, um, if you look at uh, basically uh, the production system design, as we said, the manufacturing cell is formed by allocating dissimilar machine to one cell are designed to work similar products shape. So there is a uh, one cell uh, works, if there is another cell works similar and there is a third cell and they have all type of machine in that cell and all type of machine in that cell. And all the, so it's like, this is how it, they are working with each other. On, on contract, the assembly and continuous line is, as we said, is like a, the cars, how it works. And there is a, a, a you know, a same kind with a little varieties as like, a, you know, a building a, a car assembly line. And continuous, as we said, you have one product that is not much customization needed and it, it keeps producing the same type. So the, all the machines are very similar to each other. Um, let me know if you have any question. Now, um, as we said, we spoke about manufacturing cell development and it works that way. So it is, is it a group part into a familiar that follows the common sequence. <clears throat> so um, if you will look at it, once we, we, we try to, to see how this was gonna work. So it, it is, as we said, is uh, there is a different cell and each cell made of different machines and these machines are not similar to each other and they're producing a certain level. So they're moving near to each other, the product beside each other, and they're producing it and then moving it to the next cell to do the next steps on it. So work center layer similar machines 
uh, in this center and this center and this center, and they do the same processing for it. Now, um, uh, so if you look at this, this is how it's working. Um, usually it's, it goes here. Usually the same machines here and very similar, same machines. Uh, the total of these same machines is uh, similar to these, but inside each cell, they have a different uh, equipment, different machines, something like that. Or the best look at it is you make it as a cells <coughs> and each cell has the same uh, machines, but they are, uh, you know, laid out differently. Uh, so if you're looking at this one, is very similar to this one, but they have all same equipment here, uh, uh, very similar to each other. Some adjustment there to do some adjustment for the final product. So um, you would see lots of common, uh, for example, drain, drilling, but there is one who puts plastic on it, the other one who puts a wood, which is they're different on each other. So this is where is the difference is happening, basically. Now, um, so the manufacturing cell layout dissimilar uh, machines group together in a, in a product cell. And the assembly line design, which is the most, uh, you know, uh, used one is the workstation cycle time uh, and uh, how it's uh, the time inter interval in which a moving convey passes to a series, series of workstations. Assembly line balancing is, uh, uh, it is assigned the task to a series of workstations so that the re required cell cycle time is met and ideal uh, time uh, 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 is minimized. Now, if, if I will show you later on how it looks like to, for you to understand better what we are, we are talking about. So the president's uh, relation uh, in order to which task must be assembled. Now, um, w before we start that, I would like to give you a break for 10 minutes and we will be join, we're coming back again at 10 after, uh, now is uh, 10 after two. Please come back at 10 after two to talk again about this, uh, uh, this chapter. Hopefully we can finish it uh, before the class over. As we said, we, sp we spoke about uh, the assembly line design and the workstation style time, the assembly line balancing and the uh, president's relationship in order in which the task must be performed in the assembly process. Now then the next step is like, a, you know, we look at the example, this example talks about the level of efficiencies and um, <clears throat> once we do the different workstation, um, we probably do some calculation, time calculation for it to do the, the level of efficiency. So if you notice here, we have a workstation one, which is takes 45, 45 seconds to produce it. And then it goes to the workstation um, three, uh, because we have another workstation, which is two, takes uh, 50 seconds to produce these things. So um, <clears throat> accordingly, uh, we divide each workstation with the, the process is done. And then because we wanna see eventually how these things uh, takes time. And once it's because we have a few workstation, we wanna move things according to the timing uh, uh, to move from one workstation there's another workstation just in time. So just in case uh, um, the next workstation would not uh, stay 
without uh, producing. Uh, we do uh, the time calculation for this. Uh, we would go more in the time calculation when we talk about uh, the service processing chapter. Now, um, to reduce the time uh, requirement, task time re requirement, there is a uh, different options that we can work on it. One is we can split the task. The second, we can share the task. Uh, we can use the parallel workstations and I'll show you the shapes and how they look like. And we can use the more skilled worker, more efficient so they can work more on it. They don't need to uh, move the task from one station to another station. They can do it all in one. And we, uh, we probably can do work over time or redesign the whole, the workflow itself. So these are the options of reducing task times um, to look at it. Now this shape, uh, the flexible uh, line, line out, it's, if you notice here, when the product, uh, the work comes in here, these people are not looking at each other. They're, uh, you know, so the, the, the product comes in here, he fixes it, he does his process and send it to go way down and each one will take. So if anybody is a slow, that will probably slow down the, the flow of the product. So the problem operators trap in, in, in cages, preventing sharing work. So they're not sharing work with each other. To solve this problem, you look at it and you move these, you know, eight people or whatever facing each other so they can share the work. Uh, and if he misses or he slows down here, the next one will contain, which is faster, can do it. So the solution is to remove the barriers to the operator that can trade work and operate can be added or removed as, as you wish. Um, the other problem here, um, when you have the material laying on behind, so this station is basically, his operator is called birdcage and with no uh, opportunity to share the work or add a third uh, operator. So this way is like a, you know, he takes the product, he, he processes it and send it to the line and they cannot share uh, some, uh, um, you know, uh, behind work or work is, needs more attention to it. But the best way to solve the problem is the fact is, uh, you know, the products, uh, they, they can sit in this way, but you can add one more person easily and uh, they can share the work together where if there is this, uh, the problem comes in, uh, basically uh, the situation here in the first one is the operator birdcage with no opportunity to share the work or add a third operator. Here you solve the problem, operator can help each other and the third operator can be added in this situation. So uh, this is where you can, you know, give up more flexibility. In the situation here, if you notice that the problem is a straight line, it's difficult to balance things. So things, if it's moving very quickly, um, it's a very difficult to balance accordingly. But if it's in a, in a U shape, solution you shaped, uh, line give better operator access and may reduce the need for operator. So um, it will give more flexibilities to, uh, to share the work. So um, one more thing we wanna talk about it after all talking about these different shapes of setting uh, the production. And we said that the fact how we can do that, we can split the task, we can uh, share the task, we can use a parallel workstation, we can use a, a more skilled worker over time, give them more time or redesign the shape. And we redesign the shape is like we said that they could be done, which is they cannot share the work here where we, they can the, share the flow work. Here they, there is a situation where the employee, the workers are not connected to each other and they are the bird cage. They cannot, uh, you know, cannot add one more, but in this case, 
you can add more, one more if it's necessary. Here that the problem is a straight line, is difficult to balance between them. Here is a review line, so uh, it's easier to balance the work between them. So each one will take the work and pa pass it to the end line. Now, one more thing that we need to talk about it in the in the process ma uh, manufacturing is the the break even analysis. And in the break even analysis, what we want to talk about is um, the sometimes you are working on something, and this uh, this uh, product that you are working on it, you're using the manual tools, the simple tools and they take longer for you to finish this thing. But uh, most of uh, people would like something that like a, a, you know, a powerful drilling uh, that works in, uh, in electricity instead of a, uh, a hand drilling uh, machine. Um, but that costs more money. So there is a trade-off, how often you use these things versus how much it costs. So you need to look at the balance, uh, the break-even analysis, whether it's worth to buy or uh, a new equipment, or you bring it semi-finished good, or you use your old equipment and uh, you do it slower. So the choice of a specific equipment to use in a production process can be based open on cost, benefit, cost trade-off. Um, Often the choice between the specialized and general equipment. In the manufacturing, you do, you know, you specialized equipment may require uh, higher in, uh, investment, but can uh, perform a more efficient over long term. So if you if you buy any big equipment or an efficient equipment, it can cost you so much. But if there is enough units to go through it, makes it worth because you're gonna do a, a trade-off, cost trade-offs for it. So this is like a, how you look at it. Now, general equipment often has a lower initial cost, but lack of efficiency and takes longer to do it. So this is why you do a break-even analysis. You wanna see um, uh, at how many units uh, it's going to help you to do a break even analysis for the new uh, pr specialized equipment. Let's assume that if you have something that you produce and costs you right now, uh, say $1, uh, and it takes, uh, uh, you produce 60 of them in uh, one hour, uh, and then you bring in an equipment that's very specialized, costs you so much money, but you're still going to produce only 60 of them. It takes you 10 minutes, and then you have 50 minutes doing nothing. But if the new equipment you bring, that can produce uh, 60 of them every 10 minutes, that by end of uh, 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 one hour, you have 640. Assuming that there is a demand for producing 640, something in like that sense, you have to do a break even analysis. So one mean of choosing between two options is the break even analysis. Understanding how profit and loss change for each option as the tool uh, uh, total number of, per unit. Um, this particular uh, suitable when the process has been significant initial investment. So if you're buying an equipment which is cost you $1 million, you need to justify why you ask, you ask for this $1 million equipment, replacing the uh, $10,000 old equipment, which is was producing 10 units, and you need a, a new pro, uh, equipment which is produced 100 units, in five minutes, it's much shorter term. So there is fixed costs in it, and uh, which is initial investment. And there is um, a variable cost to the number of units produced. These two things you need to calculate them to see how it's done. Now, as an example, to make it easier, 
uh, we gonna look at uh, uh, probably a manufacturing considering a three option for obtaining a machine part. Uh, the first one is say, well, the option one says buy the part from the suppliers for 200 per unit, uh, no fixed cost. You just buy ready-made and you just uh, uh, continue with that. The second option, make part on a semi-automatic lathe for a $75 uh, per unit. Uh, so you're buying it, not a full equipment, part of the equipment where it costs you around eighty thousand uh, dollars as as a you know a fixed cost and cost you seventy five dollars per unit so here you want to see whether it's worth to buy a machine which is cost you eighty thousand uh, dollars plus seventy five dollars per unit so you multiply the purchase cost which is eighty dollars plus seventy five dollars per unit into how many is needed. Now, if you want to buy a full setup machine, which is going to cost you uh, $200, uh, $200,000, and you're not going to use from the supplier anymore, but the full setup machine will cost you uh, $200,000 as a fixed cost, as initial cost, and plus $15 per every unit you produce. So what do you do here is basically, you compare it and there is an Excel sheet, but we're not gonna look at the Excel sheet. First, you're gonna do a break even between point A, which is buying it from the customers, suppliers, everything uh, to total cost for option two, which is buying semi uh, processed uh, equipment. Now, uh, semi processed equipment is cost $80,000 and each unit costs $75. Now, if you're buying, uh, you, you compare it with uh, a full uh, option, which is cost you uh, $200,000 and each unit $15. So you look at this option two and option three. And then, you know, there is one uh, which is the demand or the quantity that's gonna need it for to be produced. And you, you see the difference that you have to invest from semi uh, product to a full machine producing. You have to add another $120,000 besides the $80,000 for semi good. And here where you can see that, that you need to produce 2,000 2, units in a certain time, or this machine should produce 2,000 units in order to do a break even and go through the stage three instead of stage two. On other hand, if you are looking at uh, buying uh, straight from the supplier, which is cost you $200 versus you buying semi-finished machine, which is cost you $80,000 plus $75, then you need to do the same calculation and find out how many units that you need to produce. So to produce, uh, uh, if you planning to buy a semi-finished uh, good uh, machine, it's, you have to see that the demand for it is 64 or four unit. So you can go to your boss and says, okay, I need to, you to purchase um, uh, a semi-finished good uh, uh, machine. And if he says, why? You tell him that there is a demand of uh, this machine can help us to produce at least 64 units. And that's where we break even. We don't need to, you know, produce it. There is more variable goods, but to simplify this break even analysis. So if we put it in the graphs, we're gonna see that the fact that um, the break even analysis at the point B. So the more you produce, the more units is, uh, buy, you buy this, uh, as you buy more is the, the, the line is a straight $200 as per unit. And 
the more you produce in the beginning is very expensive because you're buying the machine at eighty thousand dollars and it keeps um uh you know uh the cost is higher than buying it but at 640 which is this point b is where you become a break even and then you start saving money then you buying the the uh, from the customer uh, from the supplier but when it comes to the uh, buying the whole set of machine you need to make sure that the you the demand is way over uh, 2000 units and um, when as a startup you have to pay $200,000 and you can keep on producing at the loss when you make it 2000 unit then you're making a break even and then you make a profit so if you notice here the 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 gap is a very smaller and later on yet here the gap is much bigger as very quickly you can cover the expenses and when it comes to a break even point machine center and buying option uh, the option here uh, the revenue is not really uh, breaking even with the other so the break even point between the machine center and buy option is not relevant because it, uh, you know you keep buying the two hundred dollars unit and you process it so it's not even uh, it's a totally out of the picture so the options is between point a and point b which one you would be going for and it looked like from the beginning as a safe side startup is the fact that um, if the demand you you do the calculation from the marketing from the sales you get the numbers needed and then you do the calculation or the historical calculation and then you decide which one you're going to do that so these is what you call a break even um, uh, uh, analysis now with this we we have finished this chapter we're going to move on with the next chapter it's rather uh, the next chapter will be uh, talking about service processes uh, uh, most of us will be more familiar with it but the the the, the second part that we're going to speak about it is that we're going to talk about more uh, applicable option see there is two way of understanding um a business one way is really to do um probably the business and that's the best way to do the work in the manufacturing this is the best way the second part to understand how the business happening is to look at uh, probably the applications is used uh, to uh, international big application which is used in uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a business. They are, uh, they call them the best practice. So once you understand how the apps is working, you definitely, there is a functionalities within the organization, which is utilized this part of functionalities of the apps, which is, it tells you exactly how this is gonna work. So uh, the second half of this chapter, we're gonna be mostly talking about uh, the different functionality within apps and this apps how it's applicable to today business because these functions did not been uh, produced if they are not applicable to the business of today so we're going to go and start talking about the the manufacturing process and uh, But uh, I, I think before we do that, um, let's have a very quick look at the video here on the service, because here we're gonna talk about mostly service. And we're not gonna see the whole video. This Zappos. The Zappos. Uh, just to give you an understanding, this Zappos company is now is one of the Amazon's uh, companies and being purchased by Amazon at the price of 
billion dollars. So it's a big operation on the, just, uh, I'll just give you a very quick look at it and then we will go to talk about the service processing. The slogan is powered by service. What started as shoes has expanded into handbags, apparel, and accessories. Their ultimate goal is to be the company that provides the absolute best service online. Zappos believes that when it comes to online purchases, immediate gratification is a critical issue. The speed and ease at which a customer receives a purchase plays a critical role in whether or not that customer will shop with you again. We're growing very, very quickly, uh, and our biggest challenge is that we need to hire good people and get them in, trained, and continue to be motivated and uh, to add value to the company. Probably the number one challenge is just hiring people, uh, finding people that are passionate about customer service, because that's what Zappos is all about. And uh, it really, it's not just for what we call our customer loyalty team, our, our call center, but for everyone that joins the company, because if the Zappos brand is going to be about the very best service, then everyone who joins needs to be passionate about customer service. There are not a lot of companies where you can go and just rave about their customer service, but the few that provide really great customer service, you have a very, very loyal following. And I think that's what has helped Zappos over time. From a business standpoint, that loyal customer base has turned into, on any given day, 75% or more of our sales are to repeat customers, customers that have purchased from us before. So we're not constantly remarketing to customers and trying to acquire new customers. You have to hire people with great attitudes and that want to provide great service. And so uh, we've uh, refined our interview and hiring process a lot over time to make sure that we are getting the right people with the right attitudes. You may be an accountant or you might be our general counsel. It doesn't matter. Uh, we care so much that you understand our history, our culture, and what we do for the customer that you go through four weeks of training, three of which in, uh, is in the classroom, a week on the phones, and then we send you to our uh, warehouse in, outside of Louisville, Kentucky, so that you can pick, pack, and ship for our customers and understand the guts of the business before you start whatever you do. When we started out, our tagline was the web's most popular shoe store, but that didn't really make sense as we expanded into handbags and apparel and so on. So we need a new tagline, and uh, you know, just like the products that we add are based on customer feedback, we asked our employees for feedback on what they thought was an appropriate tagline and uh, we knew that we wanted something that would communicate that Zappos isn't just about shoes or any specific product category, that our real product is great service and so we just thought Powered by Service made the most sense. Now this is our receiving dock, this is where all of our shoes come in from our manufacturers and distributors. Uh, these conveyors will extend into the trucks and as the trucks come in, we'll unload the master cases, load them onto the conveyor, and then the, uh, the conveyor will take it to the receiving station that it has to be received at. All the conveyor has inline barcode readers. There's barcodes on the sides of the boxes, and uh, as the box goes through the conveyors, it decides where it needs to go and routes it accordingly. Kind of on average, on a typical day, we can get about 20 to 30,000 units or pairs of shoes in any given day and sometimes as much as 60,000 in one day. After the truck, the items are automatically diverted to each one of these individual receiving stations. We have 20 of them right now. We can run 20 at one time. The receiver will op open these cases, take the individual items out of the case, and there's a, a manufacturer's UPC on each one of these. They'll scan that item, and one thing that we do is a little bit different. We put an individual barcode on every single item. So every every item, even if they're identical, will have individual serial numbers. So we can track it from cradle to grave, the history of that item. And then that also enters it into our inventory system and receives it. That's the point of receipt for us at that point. After the item is received, then all the receiver has to do is slide it over onto a takeaway belt that will then take it through our system and put it into uh, our inventory system for storage. Customers uh, will often have to return an item because it's not the color they expected. It doesn't look exactly like what they thought. Maybe it doesn't fit as well. So they return the item. And uh, all of the items come back here to return specialists. 
And these are our most highly trained teammates that we have working here because they understand a wide variety of products. This merging system right here, and we call it the spider merge because it looks like a spider with a bunch of legs. What this was designed and installed for at, at fairly big expense was to speed up the conveyors. The original configuration of the building, the first design iteration was, and very typical what almost all warehouses or distribution centers look like, is you start on the first floor and you serpentine up to the second floor, then the third floor, then the fourth floor, and then out to outbound. The problem with that was, is we had a 35 minute conveyor travel time with that system from the furthest point of pick to our outbound system. Since we want to be able to fulfill our orders in an hour or less, we can't afford to let it sit on a conveyor for half an hour. So now we have everything on all floors come together in this spider merge, all merges together and then goes to outbound. So now our conveyor travel time is five minutes instead of 35 minutes. Everything is 100% completely random access stored. By storing it completely random access, it's actually much more accurate from an inventory standpoint. The item is almost always going to be where the computer thinks it is. Our inventory accuracy is better than any company I've ever experienced with before. Uh, we have a, a quarterly audit from our bankers that audit our inventory. I know from personal history for the last two years that they've been auditing us, we've never had an inventory discrepancy, not once in two years. So that's one of the advantages of that. The other advantage is if I store things together by size, color variation, and manufacture, and I sent a picker there and I said, go pick a seven and a half Clark's brown certain model of shoe, they're more error prone. It's hand picked from here. We use RF scanners. We don't do any paper picking or, or pick from list, but the system will direct the picker where to go, what to pick, and they pick it and put it on a takeaway conveyor. It's always a moving number, but we have over 1,100 brands uh, in inventory right now on our website. We have over 900,000 SKUs. We have over 3.7 million units in inventory in this building. Um, so there's, a, you know, it's pretty staggering numbers. We sell about 27,000 units a day right now, this time of year. We expect to sell about 60,000 units a day at Christmas time this year. Right now, our average, from the time a customer clicks the button until it's sitting on a truck ready to go to our carrier, is about three and a half hours, which is very fast. And that's an average. So there's a, a fair amount of uh, variation in that. We do many of our orders in under an hour. And uh, different times of the day are faster than other times of the day. During the daylight hours, the early hours, the morning and afternoon shift, we're actually a little bit slower. We have a lighter number of workers in the building because the critical truck pulls to get it there the next day are all at night. So processing it in an hour or less right now is not very important because it's just gonna sit on the truck until tonight. Tonight, it'll be crucial. This whole building is 832,000 square feet or roughly 19.8 football fields under roof. We only built in, initially last year we moved into this building, we only built on half of that building. So 416,000 square feet is in use right now. However, in January of next year, we're gonna to have to start building in the other half. We have 23,000 feet of conveyor in the building. We have five sliding shoe sorters that are diverting things to different parts of the building. About two thirds of that conveyor is broken down for the outbound post picking processes and shipping process. And about one third of it is on the inbound side for returns and receipts. This area up here is our box manufacturing area for erecting boxes and delivering it to packing. So everything you see in this lane is all singles processing or singles packing. And uh, what the uh, packer is doing at this point is they scan the uh, barcode on the item. That scan then initiates a packing slip to be printed. She's putting a barcode on the outside that peels off that packing slip. That's now the order ID for that item. So on the shipping line, there's another sorter after we put the label on the outside. And uh, what that does is it will divert automatically down to a dock that a UPS truck is at or a FedEx truck or a postal truck is at. If it's a multi-order, the system knows that and it will automatically divert it to this side, which is the multi-sort area. If you see, we have uh, several of these uh, shelf units and each one has a barcode. It, that's a location. Each one of those locations constitutes a customer order. We have several of these 
uh, divert points, which is for that range of bins. Now, the system knows which bin that item is supposed to go to. So it'll automatically divert down the appropriate lane. It won't just randomly go down a lane. It'll go down a lane that's next to the bin that it's supposed to go in. So the sorter then takes the item off of the um, divert, scans it, and it tells them what bin to put it in. Once the order is complete, there's a printer in the middle of the uh, shelf unit that will print out a packing slip. That packing slip is the cue for the packer on the other side that that order is complete. What they will do then is um, they will scan the packing slip, which opens that order up. They'll scan the bin and they'll scan all the items in that uh, bin. That, what that does is if, in case somebody accidentally slotted it to the wrong side or whatever, this is the last quality check to make sure that we have the correct items in the right bin going to the right order. So they pack it on the other side, and once they pack it, they put it on a conveyor, and it goes off to shipping in the same area the singles do. At that point, it's an order in the box. It's completed. We keep an eye on our order cycle time throughout the day, how fast our order's being fulfilled, how many orders we have in the bucket, the workable bucket, the picking bucket, you know, the variety of buckets, so we know how to manage the workflow through the building. We have as close to a continuous flow process of I've, as I've ever seen. Uh, as orders come in, they, it's almost liquid the way they, they flow through our system and flow out. We don't batch anything up at all. The other thing is all of our systems are homegrown. So we've written and developed all of our systems the way we want them to be, not the way uh, a particular vendor would give them to us. The hardware is the hardware. It's, it's pretty, pretty standard stuff. But the software and our methodologies behind it is what's unique to us as opposed to other companies. We've grown a lot since we've moved here. Five years ago when the company moved here, we had 20 people in 50,000 square feet with about 20,000 pairs of shoes. And now we have uh, over a million square feet in total between two buildings, 832,000 feet in this building, 500 people and 3.7 million pairs of shoes. So that's a lot of growth. Okay, um, so you, you, you've seen this is, this is about a service that pro providing is basically what they do. These orders that you, you make for buying a shoes uh, for Zappos is basically they do uh, make this order with the manufacturing internationally and they bring it to them and then they just repackage it and send it to you. It's a very similar to Amazon. Uh, this is how it's done. Uh, as a drop shipping and all these process. Now, um, just to talk about the services and different kind of services, uh, we will talk about uh, probably today is more about the process of the services. And we will hope that we can finish some part of it, not everything. Um, now, uh, you need, um, in this, you will learn, understand the characteristics of the services. What makes services different than manufacturing? And uh, then analyze a simple service system, how it works, and understand the waiting line, the queuing. And then the add-on part of it, as I said, we're going to uh, start uh, looking at it from a different uh, angle, uh, which is looking at... Uh, uh, um, tier one uh, uh, and tier two applications that it use for uh, customer service and use for uh, individual service. So when you go to uh, uh, now after that, when you go to a, any company uh, like a telephone company or uh, an operating company and you know why they ask you for your phone number or your uh, name, so they can enter to the system. And it's something called, uh, probably you heard of it, customer relationship management, CRM. And part of it is it's all built at, on the, uh, the process system. Behind the customer CRM, there is the business analysis and there is a business intelligent application. They're all built for meeting the requirement of the companies. 
And what the company does is that you can see, uh, first you can see it directly, the best analogy that I can use, metaphor I can use. Sometimes you look at things directly and sometimes you have a mirror and you look at the mirror and the mirror showing the re realities there. So let's think about when we analyze the application, it's really connected to uh, production that is happening in the, in the, in the market. Now, um, <clears throat> so um, basically every service has a service package, a bundle of goods and service that offer. And uh, the bundle is consists of five features. Now, the first feature is that the supporting facilities is the physical resource such as the building, the equipment, like what you saw, in the in the v, in the film, the shop, the place where there's a physical existence. Then you have the facilitating goods, like the material purchased by the customer or provided by the customers. So the customer ordering a shoes, it comes in there and they repackage it and send it to the customer. And then you have the information, the data that provided by the uh, uh, by the customer to enable efficient and customized service. So they can see the order and then they can provide, you know, the, the requirement. And then the explicit, explicit services, which is the benefit that are readily observable, which is makes the essential feature of the service. So when you go to a store, a mobile store, or you wanna pay your bill, there is two parts of the services that you see. Services that you can see, it's done, like taking your mobile, trying to fix it or this thing. And then they ship it back there, which is that you cannot see. And then the implicit services, which is the part where when you walk into that store, for example, it's different when you walk to, uh, if your, 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 your mobile is, you bought it from a, a package from the bill, then you're buying it from no name in store. The both are probably purchasing, uh, getting it from the same source, but it's a different uh, psychological benefit that you're gonna feel about it, the prestige, the privacy uh, the, in it. So these are the five features that you look at uh, in, in the service. Now, uh, in general, the operation of classification of services is it is very straightforward and it's a service organization are classified according to the customer they service and to the service they provide to the customers. So it is classified to this, uh, the uh, customer they service and to the service they provide to the customer. There is a customer, how heavy is there is a customer contacts, the physical presence of the customer in the system, whether he's there or not, the creation of the service, the service, the system with, as we said, the physical presence of the customer in the system, whether it's the customer is there or just is doing the order online. And the service system with a high degree of customer contact are more difficult to control. So the more is there is a customer is there, the, the, the harder is to control. The work process that involved in providing the service itself. So what's the process needed to provide that service? Um, I'm probably changing the car oil when you go to loop, it's different than you go to a, a doctor, to do to check on you, then you go to a, um, a store to get a, a SIM card. So th these are different level of uh, you know your customer contact and what type of services is created and the process involved in providing the service itself. So these are the things that you need to look at it. Now. Um, The service organization uh, design, it, uh, the service cannot be stored. This is what makes it 
than different than the product. It cannot be stored. It's if there is nobody's using that service, is gone, and you have to pay for it as a as a as a owner of the business. So uh, you pay for the person to be there to provide service, and if there is nobody's there, then the service is, uh, is just uh, you know cannot be stored. The, so the, the capacity becomes more crucial. So you cannot, you don't have an inventories. And if you have 10 people, service provider, and you have one person coming in, then you might facing a problem. And if you have one person provide the service and 10 people comes in to get the service, you also might face a problem. So there is a too much capacity lead to excessive cost. Insufficient capacity lead to the customer cost. So you need to balance these two together. Enough capacity, enough manpower to provide the service for enough customers. One of the ways is to provide the waiting line models, provided a powerful mathematical tool for analyzing many common services. There is things that you can do with the waiting lines, the queue lines, that it's, it can help you so much to really um, manage your capacity versus the number of the customers who's going to be coming in. So the way you look at it, the service system design matrix, it works like this. There is the degree of customers or server contact, how many contacts and customers is coming in. And there is, there is the sales opportunity, whether you are looking to do a sales uh, or not whether you are looking to do up sales or not. And, and there is also the number of coming. So when you do a mail contact, you're not expecting to make so much you know, sales. And there is a buffer core. And, and the, the more it goes in like an internet on on-site technology, the more you, are, uh, you go on a production low efficiencies but then you have um, a better chance of making sales and your production efficiency would be less. Uh, but the, the, these are two is determined by your goal. What's your goal to, if you wanna make more sales? Uh, and the second is whether you, are, uh, uh, you wanna be more production efficiency. But who determines that is the degree of the customer server contact. So face-to-face -face total customization is usually happens in the hospital and with a doctor and dentist or a lawyer where you have to uh, more provide services and uh, it, it, it there where you charge more, but um, the production efficiencies is kind of going low but there is a chance of making more sales uh, during uh, you know, that, that part of uh, action. So this is a way of looking at it. It's uh, basically uh, when, you're, when, you're, when you have a contact and degree of customer and service contact is what you need. If, if the degree is a very low between the uh, server who, who provide the service and the customer. If it's, if it's a very low, then you need, for example, work requirement, you need a clerical person. But if it's a very high, you need somebody who do a diagnostic skills, a trade skills. So it depends on how much is this level determine where you want to be fit from worker requirement. Now from focus and op operation, um, then you look at if it's a low, they just do a paper handling, you know, just like you saw, it's just you do the scanning and you forward it to the others. But if it's a very high, you need to do uh, probably a capacity management and uh, a client mix and uh, in the middle, probably a scripting. So this degree of customer server contact is determined is what kind of a worker requirement as a skills. It needs to focus what kind of operation it needs to be done and the technological innovation, whether you need an office automation 
or you need an uh, electronic aid like this, uh, such as RFIDs, a self-service, or a client worker teams. These are all determined by this level, how high and how, how low you, you need to look at it. So the processing mail at the US Postal Code, it's a very similar, this what you want, you're looking at. The software support service troubleshooting, you need a, somebody with a verbal skills, scripting calls, and computer database. And here the certified, you need somebody like a certified accountant or a doctor or attorney. You need somebody with the diagnostic skills, a client mix and uh, client worker teams. Now, <clears throat> we'll, we'll take a, we'll finish very soon. This is the light slide. We will talk about it probably. Uh, this is only a sample and we'll start next class. Please uh, turn off your uh, your mobile. Now, uh, customer service uh, is the new role of the customer service. So the pure virtual, uh, probably the pure virtual, uh, sorry, uh, contact company enable the customer to interact uh, there is a you know um, virtual services like eBay where they do uh, customers interact with each other uh, and you got uh, a specialized like eBay and Second Life and companies enable customers to interact with one another in an open environment <clears throat> in the in the mixed virtual actually customer con uh, contact customers and they interact with one another in a server moderate. So they don't define like, you know, YouTube, Wikipedia, it's defined in that level where you can, you know, interact as a customer with a customer. Uh, it is two different virtual way of communication, customer with a customer. So in the case of Padlet, you have uh, two options which is a, sec, uh, a pure virtual customer, you know, classmate interaction or a mixed virtual, uh, which is that's what we are doing. We're putting in certain subject and you need to do uh, uh, pilot interaction. Now, before we finish the class, I wanna say one thing. Um, some of you are active in the Padlet and some of you are not. Now I put a 10% in the class participation. This is class participation. One depends on the how active you are on Padlet, how active you are in the class participation, when I'm creating rooms, when I'm doing your pools, but mostly today I'm looking at the class. You need to respond to, to the Padlet and put your comment there and write things. Um, so I'm, I'm regularly looking at that. And please, if you're not look, if you're not participating, that means you are not interested in the 10% of your uh, total mark. Okay, um, I think I'm I'm done here. Let me know if you have any question. Otherwise, uh, please feel free to 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 leave. Okay, so there is no questions. Uh, I got your assignment. I'm responding to every assignment. Hopefully we can finish it up very soon. Excuse yes. Me, sir. yes. Uh, some of our uh, class students get their marks for midterm, but some of them are not. Uh, that's not true. I haven't put the marks in uh, and for the midterm. No, I didn't get that. One of my friends is also not get. No, I, I, I haven't posted any midterm test yet. Okay. Yeah. So okay. Uh, yeah, don't worry about it. If somebody said I got it, he's mm -hmm. probably or she's probably uh, dreaming or something. So don't worry about it. Thank you, sir. No problem. You will get a mail and uh, probably yeah. uh, everybody will be notified once the, the marks is changed. It's okay, sir. Okay. Okay, sir. So Thank you. no problem. Uh, you guys have a nice day and enjoy the rest of the week. Hopefully I will spend my week
correcting tons of tests and assignments. Uh, okay, bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye-bye.